in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with you, knowing you'll see me through, and see I felt no 
so kind to me. Welcome to Flack Memorial Virtual Worship Service this morning. Glad that you could join us and hope everybody is staying healthy and safe uh, as we go through this coronavirus period. This morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 119 uh, verses 97 through 104. Uh, before I get started this morning, I just want uh, to answer a question of uh, from last week about the painting directly behind me, and that is a piece of artwork from my wife, Gail. Gail, uh, her aunt uh, painted that picture. Uh, she'd taken some art classes, and that's one of the pictures she painted. So uh, that's the author of the uh, painting behind me that you see in the background. So any other questions, I'd be happy to answer about the surroundings. Uh, this morning, uh, as we jump into uh, our study, we're looking at the uh, 12th letter of uh, the alphabet, Mem, is the letter, and it means water or Messiah, water or Messiah. And this is an interesting psalm because there's no petition, there's no request in this psalm. This is a psalm of praise for the Word of God, and it runs the gamut of emotion from beginning to end, from verse 97 through verse 104. And we mentioned uh, the last two or a couple of stanzas before that the low point of Psalm 119 had been hit. And now uh, it's almost the like this is a completely different person as we uh, look at this section of the psalm this morning. This person is extolling the virtue of God's word. 
and the impact it makes on his life. And so the title of this section is Loving God's Word, simply because right out of the gate uh, in this psalm, the writer tells us about his love, his grounded, abiding, continuing love for God's Word. And that sets the tone for the entire psalm, uh, verse 97 does. And then he gives us, as the the section unfolds, he gives us five reasons why he loves uh, God's Word. And we're going to take a look at those as we move through this this morning. Let's just stop for a moment and uh, thank God for his provision for us, uh, his care for us. Let's also pray for those around us who are suffering through this disease and perhaps lost loved ones and just the adversities of everyday life. So let's just pray for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we have together. While we're separated by miles and distance, we are not separated by our hearts being knit together in our love for our Savior and our love for his word to us. For in them are the great promises and blessings and communication to us personally. May we love the the word of God like the psalmist does. May we discover the hope and the truths that the psalmist teaches us this morning as we go through this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, just beginning in verse 97, as I mentioned in the introduction, this is a statement, an an exclamation of of the uh, psalmist's attitude towards the word of word of God. The the opening line there says, oh, how I love God's word. That's emphatic. It's explaining his attitude towards the word of God. It's not casual. It's not incidental. It's not indifferent. It is a passion plea that his love for the word of God is continuous. Notice that he says in the second line, he says, oh, how I love your word, your law. It, It is my meditation all the day. In other words, there isn't a moment in the life of the psalmist, that he isn't loving and thinking and praying God's word. It literally saturates every pore of his life, and he loves God's word. And we're going to find out why he loves God's word as we continue to unpack this section. There are five things that uh, the psalmist tells us why he loves God's word. Perhaps you will see yourself in uh, this section and some of the things that he tells us about this. Uh, love of God's Word. And as we go through it, you'll discover different nuances to why he loves God's Word, different ways in which it impacts his life. There's no doubt about it as you read this section of the psalm, verses 97 through 104, the continual playoff between your commandment, your precept, your testimony, your promise, and the interpersonal uh, interchange between God, God's Word, and the believer, the psalmist, because he comes to depend upon it. He meditates upon it. He loves it all day long. It's it's a you-I relationship. It's your word, God, you've taught me, and this is what I've done with it. This is how it impacts my life. This is how it impacts the way I live. And so I hope you'll see that there are truths here for all of us and each of us as we go through uh, these five things that the psalmist says the reason he loves God's word. First reason he gives us uh, is that it gives us wisdom from on high. It gives us wisdom from on high. There's there's an interesting play in verses 98, 99, and 100. There's an interesting play that isn't really described here, but is understood. And so we understand it better. Just uh, think of it in terms of what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter eight, uh, chapter one, verses eighteen through twenty-five. In the introductory statement to First Corinthians, Paul talks about the wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of the world, and he he elaborates in that section the difference between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. In fact, at the at the end of that little section there in First Corinthians one, Paul simply says that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of the world. And the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's eyes. And so there's this playoff between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom in that section in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. 
And here's what he makes in that, in that section, the observation he makes. He makes this observation. The world can't perceive godly wisdom because it doesn't have the heart to perceive godly wisdom. It doesn't have the one necessary thing, a changed heart. And then he goes on to say, but those who are called, those who are redeemed, those who hear and respond to the word of God, the spirit of God, and surrender their rebellious, sinful heart to Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, those people have a different perspective and a different wisdom given by God and by God's word, through God's word and through God's spirit into their lives. So the playoff in Psalm 119 verses 98, 99, and 100 is between the wisdom that comes from knowing God and knowing his word and the wisdom of the world. So with that little bit of background in mind, let's take a look at three sets of parallelisms in uh, verses 98, 99, and 100. The first parallelism is the parallelism of the the three different terms that the psalmist uses to describe God's word. In verse 97, it's commands. In verse 98, it's testimonies. In verse 100, or in verse 98, it's commands. Verse 99, it's testimonies. In verse 100, it's precepts. Those, Those first three parallels in those three verses give you the source of the psalmist's wisdom. It tells you where it comes from. And every time he mentions one of those words, he uses the word you or your. It's God's word. It's God's command, God's testimony, and God's precept. So the first parallelism in each of these three things is the source of the wisdom. Is it God's wisdom or is it worldly wisdom? Well, in those three verses, he identifies the wisdom he's talking about for himself and that he realizes is important is that it's from God. It comes from on high. The second set of parallelisms in those three verses, 98, 99, and 100, concerns the other side of wisdom. Those who appear to be wise, those who appear to have worldly wisdom about them. And he includes in in verse 98, 99, 100, three different titles for three different kinds of people. First of all, he says, they're enemies. That doesn't necessarily mean mortal enemies that are trying to kill him, but people's people whose wisdom are opposed to God's wisdom. And then in the next passage, in verse 99, he calls them teachers. And then in verse 100, he calls them the aged. So there's another parallelism of of three. The enemies, those who are opposed to godly wisdom. The teachers, those whose intelligence and expertise and philosophies and worldview stand in opposition to godly wisdom. And then the aged. Those who say, I've been through it all. If you only knew what I knew, if you'd only experienced what I've experienced, whose sole basis for wisdom is life and their observations and the experiences they've gone through. The word in verse 100 is the word aged or ancient. It may be translated. It simply means somebody who's older than us, somebody who has lived longer and had more experiences. And what he's not saying here is he's not saying we can't, learn things from people who are wiser than we are, who've experienced more things, who may even have opposing worldviews and opposing views of God's wisdom. It isn't that we can't learn from those people and they don't have things to impart, but what he's getting to is a bottom line view, the bottom line. And then the third parallelism here in this section that we'll notice as we talk about it is, number one, in verse 98, he says, if the God's wisdom makes him wiser than those around him who hold on to worldly wisdom and reject godly wisdom. It makes him wiser. Second thing he says in verse 99 is it gives him more insight, more understanding, more discernment, more ability to use the wisdom that he's got skillfully. And then the, the third part of that parallelism is that it gives him more understanding. That's kind of an interesting word there more understanding, because there he's talking about the ability to use it in a, in a sense of life. Uh, the word understanding there uh, means to uh, look clearly, consider with full attention. Uh, in other words, it's an insight, it's a wisdom that gives you clarity on what's going on, and it comes from, again, those three parallelisms of God's commands, testimonies, and precepts.
So in, in verses 98, 99, and 100, the wisdom he's talking about is the wisdom that comes from God from on high. And it clearly makes a distinctive in the way he thinks and the way he lives and the way he walks in all three of those verses. What he is not saying is that he's wiser than everybody else, and so everybody ought to come and ask him answers to life questions. He's not saying that. And he's not saying that there isn't anything he can't learn from outside sources other than God's word. But what he is saying is this. He is saying that the wisdom from God's word is superior to the wisdom of the world. Back to the 1 Corinthians 18 through 25 passage. Paul makes this clear statement about godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom will never lead you to know God. Only the wisdom that God gives through Jesus Christ in his word will ever lead you to know God and understand God and God's word. The only way you can know God, know God's word, understand God's word is to get into it and by the spirit whom God has given us to teach us and instruct us, understand with the clear discerning understanding of God's word and God's spirit how to live your life. It's literally... Paul says there in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, God's wisdom is literally a pathway, a guide to the path of how to live life, that, a life that pleases him, and a life that displays godly wisdom as opposed to worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom can only take you so far. Godly wisdom takes you to understand God's law, what offends God, and as a result, how to please him. That's what godly wisdom does. So what he is saying is that the wisdom from God's word is superior to the wisdom of the world. Superior in what sense? Superior in that only by God's word and God's law can we know what offends God. And only by knowing God's word and God's law can we know how to solve the problem that God has provided and accepted. In this passage, verses 98, 99, and 100, the wisdom that he's he's talking about is the worldly wisdom that those who appear to be wise by the world standards uh, lack the wisdom that comes from the law of God. Again, the 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25 passage demonstrates that. Let me give you two examples from the Bible. First example is that of Daniel. When Daniel's carried off into captivity by, by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, the very first thing you read in the book of Daniel is the distinctive difference that is displayed in the way you live your life by following God's word or following worldly wisdom. Daniel's life is a living illustration of this section of Psalm 119, 97 through 104. Daniel loves God's law. He obeys God's law. It becomes for him the means of living better than what the world lives. And so you'll read right there in Daniel chapter 1, pitting God's wisdom versus worldly wisdom. And in the end, which is better? Godly wisdom. And the second illustration I want to give you is that when you read Psalm 119, 97 through 104, think of one other person. Think of Jesus, who demonstrated godly wisdom because, as Paul says later on in 1 Corinthians 1, Jesus Christ is wisdom. For the believer, for the psalmist, wisdom, wisdom wasn't just a set of philosophical points or ethical statements. Wisdom was a person. The psalmist calls him God, Lord. Paul calls him Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 1. And so he's simply saying that God's wisdom is superior to the world's standard of wisdom. And there's two illustrations then. Daniel, and Jesus. The psalmist then is literally saying in those three verses, the psalmist is saying he is made wiser than those, than he's made wiser because he submits to God's word than to his enemies, his teachers, and his elders. In other words, all the, all the world standards of wise people by obeying God's word, submitting to it, and following it,
he is wiser than those three groups of parallels in verses 98, 99, and 100. So what's the lesson from these three verses? Simply this, the psalmist loves God's word because it gives him wisdom from on, on high. It helps him, A, understand what he needs to do. B, it helps him understand how to do it. It makes him effective and efficient in his walk with God and the way he lives in, his, in this world. The second thing he mentions uh, that the reason why he loves this God's word is found in verse 101. It's because it, it gives him a sense of a roadmap. He literally, this section, verse 101, is simply entitled Paths of Righteousness. And here's what it says. It says in verse 101, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. Here's something interesting in this verse. He draws a contrast. He, again, in verses 98 through 100, he draws a contrast between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Here in verse 101, he draws a contrast in the way we live our lives out between the godly wisdom and the worldly wisdom only. This time he uses the word evil, and that's an interesting word as we'll see in a little bit. What's he say about following God's wisdom there in the first part of 101? He says, I have restrained my, uh, I have restrained my feet from every evil way. It's intensely practical, practical, the application of God's wisdom to everyday living. He says, I restrain my feet. The word restrain there in Psalm 101, 101 means to stop, withhold, or contain. In other words, he looks at where he's going through the lens of God's wisdom, and he says, nope, that's not a way to go. That's not a trail to follow. Nope, that's not good for me. The word evil there is an interesting word in verse 101 also. It means to be bad. It also means to be inferior in quality which he's already spelled out in verses 98 through 100. He's seen the clear advantages of obeying God's word in his life, in his, the way he thinks and lives. And now in Psalm 101, he says, there's a difference, there's a contrast in implementing God's wisdom into my life or following worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is going to lead me down the path of an inferior quality. It's going to lead me, uh, another meaning of that word also means uh, wicked. Ethic in ethical quality. In other words, it's disagreeable to God. That's what the word evil means there. Most people don't even stop to think about anything they do or everything they do in, return, in terms of being disagreeable to God. Yet a person dominated by God's wisdom and God's word, as the psalmist is here in this section, everything he does all day long, he runs through the grid of God's word and asks the question, is this disagreeable to God or not? because he loves God and his word. So he doesn't want to do anything that will offend God. And so in verse 101, you have some practical implication. God's word leads him, leads him in paths of righteousness. It keeps me on the right path. In this word, in this verse, the psalmist makes the connection between what he believes and how he behaves. There's a connection then in this verse, between belief and behavior, and they're seen as one. What I believe to be true, how I'm going to live my life, and what values I value in my heart must translate into the way I live my life. And so he pays attention to where he goes. He says, I contain my feet. I watch where I walk. And he simply contrasts the evil path to the righteous or pure wrath path or the right path that is agreeable to God. So the second thing he learns from loving God's word is it helps him function in everyday living. The third thing that we learn and that he teaches us about loving God's word is found in verse 102. This is an interesting verse. It's unique because it contains a double pronoun, which is odd in Hebrew language. And to do that is to intensify the double pronoun. So when you look at verse 102, here's what he says. He says, I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. You catch that? I hope your translation has that in the second line of verse 102. The double pronoun, you yourself. It emphasizes who his teacher is. The importance of a teacher is invaluable. 
You want to go to the best schools with the best professors in the field of study that you're in so you gain the best understanding of the subject matter you're training. And here in this psalm, the psalmist literally is saying, if you want the best teacher for life, here's where you should go. You should go to God's word and to the God of the Bible. He's not saying in verses in this section in verses 97 through 104, he's not saying that following God's word is one way to live a better life. He's saying in these verses that following God's word, obeying God's word, loving God's word, which in effect is saying loving the God of this word in Revelation, is the only way to live a life that is pleasing to God, agreeable to God, and helps you navigate the pits and snares of this world. And so he says there in Psalm 102, God, you yourself have taught me. You yourself have taught me. James Montgomery Boyce says of this verse, it makes him think of Genesis 3, where God comes walking in the cool of the evening, as was his custom, a, a pattern and a habit established in the garden between Adam and Eve and God. God comes walking in the cool of the evening to communicate, to teach, instruct, and fellowship with his creatures, Adam and Eve. And on one day, he finds them hiding. Why? Because they've ceased to love God's word, and they love their own wisdom now. Only it's made them afraid of God. And what James Montgomery Boyce says about thinking about this verse isn't that walking and talking with God as the old hymn says in the garden, I come to alone and he walks with me and talks with me. It's just me and Jesus and nobody else. What he's talking about there isn't the solitude, the isolation, the individuality of it. What he thinks of when he reads Psalm 102 and the Genesis 3 is that God still wants to teach us through his word. He still wants to be our main instructor, if not our only instructor. And the psalmist simply echoes that thought of what was lost in the Garden of Eden, yet for him becomes a reality. I want to have the same communication lines that Adam and Eve did before sin with God and his word. I want God to be the one who teaches me. Notice the effect of what happens when you go to the best teacher. You yourself have taught me. Notice what happens. When you read or study the Bible, whose voice do you hear? Do you hear my voice? Do you hear the voice of another person on television or radio or, or in digital format? When you read a book on the Bible, do you hear the voice of the author of that book? What the psalmist hears when he reads the Word of God is he hears God's voice, and he hears God teaching him. And he says, that's the best teacher you can get, and that's the best wisdom you can get. The psalmist hears God's voice, just like in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve would hear God's voice and come running until sin had entered in. And worldly wisdom usurps the place of the relationship with God. Then another thing that the psalmist says by loving God's word he has learned is that God's word is easy to take in. Psalm 103 is an interesting picture um, because they didn't grind down grain, uh, cane sugar and make sugar. They used what was naturally available and honey was a valuable commodity for sweetening uh, various kinds of meals and things. Honey was also used as a medicinal purpose uh, in, in biblical cultural times. But then Psalm 103, here's what the psalmist says, and you, you get a sense of his emotion and his passion and his attitude for his love for God's word there from verse 97, when he says in verse 103, how sweet uh, are your words to my taste. The picture there in Psalm 103 is that God's word is smooth. It's smooth like honey. It's sweet like honey. It's easy to take in. Uh, Hebrew midwives, when a child was born, would take their finger and plunge it into a bowl either of olive oil or honey, 
and stick it on the palate, the roof of the mouth of the, of the baby and around the edges of the tongue, the lips, because that's where the greatest sense of, of taste was. And it would taste good and it would cause the baby to start sucking the finger, thus nurse and get the important value of the mother's milk in their life. And he's literally looking at that, at, at God's word, and he says, God's word is sweet. It's easy uh, to take in. Uh, and it's valuable for me. It's smooth and easy to ingest. God's word is easy to take into my life. Do you ever think of God's word that way? Do you ever think of God's word as honey? Uh, if it isn't chocolate and if it isn't soda and if it isn't sugared, then we don't generally like it, even though it may be physically bad for us. But we crave that sensation of sweetness, of taste. And he's simply saying God's word. The reason I love God's word and the wisdom I get from it is because it's easy to ingest. You ever think of scripture as being sweet? And what does that mean? It means it's easily ingested. And you think of God's law and you think, how can God's law be uh, easily ingested? Think of all the things that it warns us about and prohibits us from doing. But the word law there doesn't mean just the codes and the commandments. It means everything, the whole thing included, his promises, his testimonies, his instruction, the wisdom that comes from it, the things that make us wise, wiser than our worldly counterparts. It also helps us navigate the reality of life. And so he literally says, my attitude and my passion for God's word is like eating something sweet. It literally comes into me easily, easily absorbed and taken into. Is that your attitude towards God's word? It should be. We should crave it, Peter says, like mother's milk when we are wee babes, small children. What is he saying there? He's simply saying, what is sweet? The promises or sayings of God. And what he's literally doing is he, he's not only looking at it as a whole, but he's, he may be even thinking of it as individual promises or individual statements. Um, you know, the soul that sinneth that shall surely die. That's kind of a harsh one to take in. But it warns us that there, we are at odds with God. But then we stop and think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that what did God do? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should what? Not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ being rich in his grace, God being rich in his love and mercy, poured out his love, how? In the coming of Jesus Christ, the death of Christ. Think of all the individual verses. Think of Proverbs 3, 5 uh, and 6. You know, the, the instruction to not lean on your own understanding, but to lean on the wisdom of God and he shall direct your paths. What a wonderful picture that is of Psalm 97 through 104. The promises or sayings of God are what is sweet, and he's literally saying, that helps me. God's word is sweeter than honey. It's the best thing I could ever take into my life. I have a craving for it. Then the last thing that he says, loving God's word has taught him, is that it's taught him to hate every wrong path. Notice the, notice the range of emotion from verse 97 to verse 104. In verse 97, he's exclaiming how he loves God's word. It's with him all day long. It, it saturates every pore of his being. And then the result of that in verse 104 is every evil path, every inadequate, of disagreeable path to God, I stay away from. I literally hate. Hate's a strong word there. It means to be unloved. It means to be unloved. What an interesting contrast between following God's worldly, God's godly wisdom in verse 97 and the contrast of following worldly wisdom in verse 104. It's a love-hate relationship. It's a love-hate relationship. And he simply says, at the opposite end of loving God's word is his disdain from following in worldly wisdom. And he simply makes this observation in this, in this verse. He simply says that God's wisdom aids me in discerning the way I should go, discerning the way I should live my life, discerning the manner of conduct in which I, I live out my life in everyday decisions and behavior and manners, and the way I treat people, the way I love God and fear his word, the way I serve 
Godly wisdom helps me know the difference between worldly wisdom, worldly paths, and the paths I should take. He says literally there in Psalm 104, from your precepts, I get understanding. The word understanding is interesting there because it simply means to have clarity of skill and understanding. Clarity of skill and understanding. It means to discern, to make a, a good choice or a better choice or make the best choice. I gain understanding from your precepts. Precepts. I get the true wisdom I need in order to avoid the wrong path of life. Alec Moyer, as he writes in his book on the Psalms, makes an interesting observation about Psalm 103 and 104 as it relates to our makeup as human beings. He makes this observation in Psalm, that he thinks Psalm 103 refers to the psalmist looking at how God's word, how God has transformed his life and cleaned up his life, a transformation in Psalm 103. And the first area that he looks at is emotions. Because Psalm 103 is so central, it talks about the taste buds and, and the lips and the mouth and tasting the honey, God's word, that it's sweet and easy to take in and that he loves it. He meditates on it. It becomes for him his lifeblood. It's sweeter to him than literal honey. And so Alec Moyer looks at Psalm 103 and he says, this is the new emotions of a believer who follows God's word. Our emotions are tempered by God's word so that we become like God's word. It's sweet. And so our emotions don't rule our lives. Our, lives are, our emotions are ruled by God's word. The second thing he points out is in the first line of Psalm 104 where he says, here he sees that God's word gives us a new mind. We have discernment, Psalm 104a, from your precepts I get understanding. I get the ability to discern between right and wrong, good and bad, wicked and righteous. So then he says, not only do my emotions change, but my thinking changes. I get a sense of new discernment. Romans 12, 1 and 2 come to mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's wisdom helps us think clearly and discern correctly. And then the last thing that Alec Moyer sees here in this last verse, the last line of Psalm 104, is a new will. And what's he say in Psalm 104b? He says, I therefore, I hate every false way. It affects what he does, what he chooses, his will. I'm not going down that path. I make a willful, determined, discerning choice. Based on God's word, I'm not going to pursue that pathway. It's disagreeable to God. It will bring me all kinds of trouble. I'm not going down that path. I'm going to follow God's wisdom. What a valuable lesson to learn in this passage. Five things that he tells us the reason he loves God's word. Number one, it gives him wisdom from on high. Number two, it directs him in the right path. He makes a conscious effort to follow the path of righteousness. The third thing is that God is my teacher. Do you want the best instruction available for dealing with life? Then you go to God and his word. You yourself, he says, are my teacher. And then fourth thing he says is that God's word is sweeter than honey. I crave it. It becomes to me easy to take in. And it becomes even better than literal physical honey for my diet. My spiritual diet, he's saying, is significantly superior to my physical diet. And then the last thing he says, there the fifth thing he says is that I hate every wrong path. It helps him. It renews his emotions, his mind, and his will. It literally affects every area of the soul, of the life. It changes the way our emotions function, it changes the way we think and our attitudes, and it changes the choices, the will what we choose to do and not to do. It all comes back to obeying God's word. And it all comes back to the interplay between your commandments, your testimonies, your precepts, and what I do with them. It literally forms a loving relationship between God and the follower of Jesus, the follower of God's word. It literally becomes a life 
first aid kit uh, literally becomes being like Jesus, who is our wisdom. What a valuable lesson we learn in this section. One other interesting thing about the word mem, it means water or Messiah. Is there anything more transformational, more cleansing than the word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ? Is there anything that will help us clean up our act and live a life that is pleasing to God and at peace with the world around us than the wisdom of God? I don't think so. Well, that brings us to the end of this section. I hope you fall in love with God's word as much as the psalmist does. I hope I do. I hope we find the five things that he teaches us here to be valuable in the days ahead as we face adversity of every kind and strength. And so just words of, of encouragement as we part uh, this last uh, Sunday of April. First of all, pray for one another. For those who are going through tough times, continue to share, reach out to those uh, in uh, the church family, to the leaders, leadership team, uh, if you've got prayer concerns you want to share. Uh, also, uh, just continue to find opportunities to do good to others, not only in the church family, but around who are hurting in this time. Stay healthy, stay safe. We miss you. We look forward to seeing you next week in one form or another. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your grace to us. Thank you for your word you've given us. Thank you for disclosing yourself to us. For the heart that doesn't know your godly wisdom, I pray, Lord, this morning at this time, they see the difference and that they would surrender to you and come to taste the wonderful relationship between God and, and themselves and between God's word and their life, that they would seek the best teacher, the best wisdom, and the best walk. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stay safe and healthy. God bless you, and we will see you soon.